What's going on everyone, Jace Two Cents here, and since it's the end of the year and we're lazy and we're kind of out of ideas, cause, you know, I, I'm dumb. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> I figured we would go ahead and do another one of the, going to build a PC subreddit and answering some of the builder newbie questions. You guys really seemed to like that previous video. You guys said, please do more of this. And it gives me an opportunity to sort of like get more answers out there with people that maybe need the help. So anyway, without further ado, let's get started. The all new IQ Link ecosystem for Corsair finally removes all the cable clutter from your PC. IQ Link components synchronize RGB lighting and settings between connected devices with a single wire, creating a chain of devices on a single port via the Link Hub. Take control of your system and ditch the clutter by following the sponsored link in the description below. Okay, so the Build a PC subreddit has a, what appears to be a daily, like, simple question, questions thread, which I think is kind of neat, and it's an auto moderator. So that means every day, I guess, it's just adding a new thread. There's already 63 questions in there. I didn't notice this last time. I'm going to answer a few from this. I won't go specifically to only this thread, but this is kind of neat because it gives people a place to add a, ask a question that maybe doesn't warrant a whole post. Moving on, uh, the very first question here comes from Spartan VFL. It says, my monitor supports HDMI, but my KVM switch uses DisplayPort. Bought an HDMI, to okay, I don't care about that one to be honest, because we're talking about KVMs and a lot of people probably, that's not a unique situation, or it is a unique situation. Phil, cut all that out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this one comes from, your Banny Jugoslavin, Yugoslavin says, Hi guys, need some help deciding. Buy one stick of RAM, Viper Steel DDR4, 32GB, 3200 megahertz. I'm already gonna tell you go with two. Okay, it says right here number two, buy two sticks of RAM, Kingston Fury B, 16 gigabytes, two times eight, DDR4, 3600 uh, megahertz CL for 49 euro. I can tell you right now, there are absolutely 32 gigs of, of RAM available for around the 50 euro price point. So I'm not sure why. Um, he's sticking with 16. There is Euro, $50 Euro DDR4, um, 30 gig stick, 32 gig sticks. The reason why I'm saying going with the Kingston Fury Hyper Be or Beast has nothing to do with the brand, uh, as much as it has to do with the fact that dual channel, even though it's slightly slower, CL17 versus CL16, and obviously half of the capacity, although faster, 400 megahertz faster um, in its transfer speed, is more important. So dual channel is gonna be way more beneficial to your CPU than single channel at twice the volume. In fact, having that much volume in a single channel is actually gonna be quite a bit slower overall than going with dual channel at half the volume. So having two channels of RAM to be able for the CPU to communicate back and forth with and trade off is gonna be way more beneficial. I would always, always, always recommend dual channel over single. The reason why I would recommend a 32 gig if you can find it over the 16 gig is the moment you add four sticks of RAM to your CPU, you're not guaranteed to run at the XMP profile. There's many reasons for that. Obviously we're talking single rank, dual rank, we've got binary and non-binary RAM, uh, as well as the fact that we're dealing with XMP and transfer speeds that are not guaranteed on CPUs, memory controllers. And the memory controller has a variance in silicon quality just like the CPU itself. So always go for the fastest two stick option that you can go with for dual channel. It's just, in fact, I'm gonna do a video in the future specifically talking about binary and non-binary RAM because people have talked about single rank and dual rank, but the binary aspect of it is a whole nother can of worms that a lot of people don't talk about. So we'll talk about that coming up. Could you unconnect front panel USB header cause a short? Oh, can it unconnected? Wow. Can Jay read the word on the screen? <laughs> Leave me alone, there's reasons, okay? Could an unconnected front panel USB header cause a short? Touching the top of my Fractal Terra with a bit of static charge shorts out my PC and it restarts. I have, a, I have triple checked the motherboard standoffs and all is fine into that, uh, in that sense. So I guess my PSU issue may be next to check, it's plugged in. Okay, USBs are very sensitive. Um, so for instance, if you have a USB header plugged in to front panel and then you have the front panel sitting there, I'm sure many people would notice if they go to plug in like, so USB is, hot, is a hot port, right? So what that means is that you can plug things in and out of it, uh, hot swappable, right? So you plug in a mouse with the PC on, unplug the mouse with the PC on, drive, USB stick, whatever. Sometimes people will notice like, you don't always get it straight, right? It's a, it's a super position, right? So you always have to try it three times, right? The first position doesn't go, you try it again. Then the third, the third one, which is the first one goes, right? Super position, it wasn't observed, therefore it didn't go. So when it comes to plugging that in, sometimes it'll be sideways and it might, touch the metal or might, might, might touch the case or something. In my instance, in every, like my home PC, this PC here at work, anytime I plug in a mouse or something, it almost always turns off my monitor for a few seconds. And the reason for that is it does, sometimes there can be a slight static short or something in there. That's not uncommon. 
for that to happen with USB. What is not common is your PC completely restarting. So that tells me that there could be uh, some issues going on there regarding maybe, I, my first thought is potentially a ground, but this tells me your PSU is just being very sensitive to that static charge of that plugin. Um, because believe it or not, static could be built up through the cable, through paracord and all that, and it just kind of holds a charge through the cable. When you plug it into the system, it gives that tiny little mic, like millivolt zap that then the PSU goes, whoa, what was that? And then turns itself off. Not enough to cause like an overcurrent protection where the PSU like completely trips itself and you have to power cycle the plug out of the PSU to get it to restart. Um, this tells me your power supply just might be very sensitive to that sort of stuff. Okay, so this one comes from Geobito Geo Chiha. Sorry. He says, I feel like I should know this considering I've built multiple PCs, but does it matter what slot you put a second M.2 in? Okay, so it really depends on the motherboard and the generation we're talking about here. He doesn't say if it's Gen 3, Gen 4, or Gen 5. Gen 5 motherboards right now tend to only have one Gen 5 M.2 slot. And those are usually the very top one closest to the CPU. And that's a direct Gen 5 PCIe to the CPU lane. Everything else tends to go through like the chipset and then to the CPU. And those tend to be Gen 4 older if we're talking about a Gen 5 motherboard. Same potential thing could be if you're talking about Gen 4, although Gen 4 motherboards tend to almost all be Gen 4, some direct to the CPU and then through the chipset to the CPU as well. Let's say we're talking about something like, uh, I don't know, MSI motherboards. A lot of them have like five M.2s now all flat on the motherboard underneath covers, like under the GPU and stuff. So your fastest drive and your OS drive should be the top one. The top one's typically gonna be the fastest because it doesn't go through the chipset, it's direct to the CPU. Now, if we're talking about you using some sort of a, uh, like Asus motherboards have the DIM.2, Right, so you have the DIM.2, which have two M NVMe slots on there. What tends to happen on those is you're gonna find that those speeds are shared through that, that DIM.2. You could put two Gen 4 drives on a Gen 4 DIM.2, but then they are going to slow themselves down to PCIe Gen 3 speeds simply because of the fact that they're sharing that particular bus. Now, that bus is supposed to also be direct to the CPU. That's why it's called a DIM.2. It's real convenience comes from the fact that you can remove it easily and change out your drives. But what you'd find is that you're gonna have a slower overall speed through the DIM.2 with multiple drives in it than say if there was only one. So you could put one drive in there and then get the full speed of that drive. Now, it's really gonna depend on your motherboard's configuration when it comes to uh, M.2. A lot of motherboards, you have to go in and configure the M.2 slots to have particular speeds or particular uh, lanes available to them. So the rule of thumb should be, the second drive tends to not really matter where it goes, but sometimes people will get a newer, faster drive and put it in a slower port. If you have like a Gen 3 C drive, right? Your, your OS drive, and you have it in your top slot, then let's say that top slot is a PCIe Gen 4, then you're not really doing yourself any favor by utilizing a Gen 4 slot with a Gen 3 drive. So you could take that Gen 3 drive and move it into one of your second slots and take your faster, let's say game drive, like a Gen 4 drive, put it in the faster Gen 4 slot up by the CPU, because which port your drive is in doesn't matter to the OS. It's just needs to know what drive to boot the, the bootloader from and then off it goes to the races. So sometimes it might make sense to reconfigure your drive layout if you get a faster, newer drive that is not your OS drive. Okay, so what does exactly new PCIe 5.0 means? Is it the slot in the MOBO or the GPU power connector in the PSU or a specific M.2 SSD storage or a cable? Yes, it's all those things. PCIe 5.0 can mean multiple things, but there is a power spec PCIe that's specifically for powering a PCIe gen device. Um, there's the generations, obviously, 5.0 being the newest one. Um, obviously, your motherboard has to be able to support a PCIe Gen 5 device, but it doesn't mean that if you don't have a PCIe Gen 5 motherboard that you can't run a PCIe Gen 5 device. It just means it's gonna run at a slower gen spec. All current PCIe Gen stuff is backwards compatible. For instance, if you have a PCIe, so all, all GPUs right now are technically PCIe Gen 4. They're technically Gen 4. They might be calling themselves Gen 5 in some instances because of the cable and stuff, but they're technically Gen 4 speed devices. So NVMEs or M.2s tend to be really, and RAID cards and stuff, tend to be the only real Gen 5 devices right now. So yeah, it can be kind of confusing for new builders to try and understand what exactly PCIe Gen 5 means. 
It's really something that's a bit confusing for people that tends to renew the confusion every time a new PCIe generation comes out. We've seen it from PCIe 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, and 4 to 5. All right, is a 165 hertz monitor worth buying if I can only hit 100 to 130 FPS? Okay, so he says his game is Valorant, uh, and the FPS has been getting around 100 to 130. I currently have a 60 hertz monitor, I was planning on upgrading to 165 hertz monitor, but I've heard some stuff like screen tearing could be a problem since my FPS is lower than the monitor's refresh rate. So could it, that's kind of backwards actually. Typically screen tearing happens when your refresh rate is lower than the FPS being sent by the graphics card. And that's when you turn off any sort of sync tech. I would 100% recommend getting a monitor that has a higher refresh rate than what your graphics card is capable of pushing. Not because of the fact that um, you, whether or not you can or can't hit it, it's just the fact that that's gonna actually limit the possibility of screen tearing. Now, what you often would want to do is if you have a refresh rate that is on your monitor that's higher than your game's capability of pushing is one, you could lower the frame rate or the Hertz rating in your OS down to like 120. But if that frame rate that your game is actually capable of is significantly lower than what the monitor is capable of, what you'll tend to often then notice is input lag. This is why things like G-Sync and FreeSync actually become very popular these days is because a lot of those frames are just straight ignored. In fact, that's what NVIDIA's FastSync was about. It was actually ignoring a lot of those frames entirely to keep the frame as in sync with the input of that frame through your mouse and keyboard and stuff to keep them as in sync as possible so that you're not getting perceived input lag. That's what fast sync was specifically about, but it's gotten a lot faster than that. Here's a good one. Speaking of monitors, is it worth buying a 4K monitor to scale down to 1440p? He says, I have a 3070 with a 3900X and I wanted to upgrade my monitor as it's a bit overkill for 1080p. I wanted to also upgrade the GPU eventually. Should I buy a 4K monitor and downscale to 2K or buy a 2K monitor for now and just keep that until I upgrade? Both monitors I'm looking at are the same price today. So he's looking at Asus Tough VG28. Okay, so that's a 28 inch UHD 144 Hertz versus an LG 27 inch uh, 165 Hertz QHD gaming monitor. Okay, so UHD, that's the 4K 144 Hertz, and then the QHD, that's the 1440p 165 Hertz. Um, I guess that depends on how long before you think you're gonna be able to actually push 4K gaming with your system. So your 3070 and 4K, they, it can give you a 4K image. It's not gonna be great. That's why you're talking, and when I say not great, I'm talking about the, the, the frame rate of your GPU, depending on the games that you play. You don't say what games you played. There's a big difference between running Rocket League at 4K versus running Battlefield at 4K versus running Cyberpunk at 4K. These are very, very different situations and circumstances here regarding GPU power. But what I'm gonna tell you right now is 1440p resolution on a 4K monitor looks like crap. It looks like absolute crap because of the fact that we are talking about a resolution that does not scale linearly with the 16 by nine aspect ratio. So if you were, if you were like, I'm gonna play at 1080p with a 4K monitor, do you, for now, would you recommend that? I would say yes, only because of the fact that four pixels in a square equal a single, uh, and a 4K monitor equal a single pixel in 1080p. So although it would look much more pixely, when you finally were able to run 4K, you would get the full resolution on it. And the amount of time, or the time that you're gonna be playing 1440p on 4K, it's gonna look fuzzy, it's gonna look like the edges are all weird, some of the text is gonna look terrible because of the fact that it does not scale perfectly. But I personally feel like 1440p high refresh rate is the perfect sweet spot at the size of screen that you're looking at. 20, 27 inch for, 4K, for um, 1440p, I wouldn't go any bigger than that for 1440p or the text might start looking a little bit pixely. If you were saying like 32 inch, I'd say, yeah, get a 4K. But I think 27 inch, 165 hertz QHD is gonna be a perfect sweet spot for gaming and resolution. So I personally would never run 1440p on a 4K monitor. It's gonna look like absolute trash. Now, the other thing that you can consider too is your 3070 does have DLSS uh, 2, so DLSS 2.0. You could get the 4K monitor, just make sure that if you're running titles, that support DLSS, because DLSS on quality, even quality settings or even balance settings are gonna look so much better than running 4K on 1440p native without DLSS. So I would run 4K with DLSS on in your games versus 4K panel 14, uh, 1440p non-DLSS. It's gonna look better with DLSS on in 4K. But again, that need more information. Your titles are not here and that is actually the other half of the story. 
Okay, so here's an interesting one. It says, will there be a significant boost of performance after getting a GPU upgrade from an R9 290X, which I think came out in 2012? Okay, so October 24th, 2013, more than 10 years ago. That is a 10 year old GPU. Yes, the RTX 3060 is going to beat the 290X, which sometimes people get it caught in their head like, well, this is the flagship card. There's no way a lower end card, which the 60 series, the only thing lower than it technically is a 3050, uh, is going to be faster than a flagship. Well, yeah, when that flagship's a decade old and this card is three years old, right? So, um, yeah, it can, the, the flagship or the 3060 came out in uh, 2020, September, October time of 2020. So you definitely uh, are going to get a huge boost in performance. He says, I'm receiving soon RTX 3060 and I'm wondering how much is performance boost I'm getting because the CPU is an i5-6500. Most games I play are like Warzone, Far Cry 5, and uh, FC24. So Warzone's probably gonna play like crap, continue, because your your CPU is a bit low spec here. I mean, i5-6500, when did that come out? Let's see, i5-6500. Okay, so that came out in 2015. It is not overclockable. It's 14 nanometer, six gen, four core, four threads, so no hyper threading or anything like that. So yeah, Warzone's gonna play like crap no matter what. Uh, what you'll be able to notice is that you can crank the settings. You'll be able to crank the settings in Warzone higher than you can with the, the 290X just simply because of the graphics power. And in fact, because your CPU is so old in terms of its spec, it's, it's a low tier spec, it's not overclockable, and it came out nine years ago, um, you just want to turn your graphics fidelity up as high as you can in all your games. Let the 3060 just run as fast as it wants or as hard as it wants by rendering any of these details because of the fact that your CPU is going to be slowing it down anyway. Let it do all the details. Um, if you are receiving it already, then just know you're getting a huge boost in performance already. All right, well, that's where we're gonna go ahead and end it. If you guys uh, are interested in this series continuing, make sure you sound off down below. Make sure you subscribe if you're new around here and click the bell and stuff. YouTube does not believe um, that uh, things should be notified. So you gotta go in there and constantly adjust those settings because YouTube is turning them off on tons of people and it's actually getting really annoying. People are asking me all the time, like, why'd the bell turn off? I'm like, I don't know, it's YouTube. They do stupid stuff all the time. Anyway, guys, I hope you guys had a great Christmas. I hope you guys are looking forward to the new year. 2024 is gonna be a, a fun year for us. We've got a lot of changes on the way we're gonna be doing a lot of things and I think you guys are gonna enjoy what we have in store for you. Um, anyway, we'll see you guys in the next one. Until then, Insert motivational quote here.